Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and, and good afternoon. Uh, so I just want to start by setting the scene, giving a little bit of context first. So back in 2019, uh, there was an estimated 4,300 people uh, sleeping rough. That was a 141% increase from 2010, although a slight improvement from 2018. And there was a further 35,000 people staying in hotels uh, at that time. So back in 2019, uh, Riverside, we commissioned a piece of research through uh, York University, which comes on to my next slide, which is what we, what we term now as a, a traumatized system, because what we'd seen through this piece of research was almost a perfect storm in terms of policies and the impact of different policies had made on the increase in homelessness. So there'd been a, a £1 billion reduction in spend on homelessness services. Now that was a reduction in, in units, in bed spaces, but also in community-based uh, floating support. And in addition to that, we'd also seen significant cuts in other complementary services, such as drug and alcohol treatment services, access to mental health services. All of these things were having an impact on, on, on the homeless uh, sector. We knew that there were, it was well publicised that we were living through a national shortage of housing. There'd been uh, changes to welfare benefits, such as the introduction of universal credit, Plans to introduce the law called housing allowance on housing benefit had also had a significant impact on the development of new homelessness services. So if you put all those things together, you were seeing what we would call a perfect storm. Now, by 2019, we'd also began to see a greater focus and more funding from government, and they'd recognise that they needed to do more. So we were seeing what we'd call some green shoots. We, with the introduction of housing first and housing first pilots and just a greater focus on, on homelessness. So then that takes me up to where we really want to talk about, which was uh, COVID-19. So uh, I, at the end of March last year, the, many of you all know this, the, local, the government wrote, wrote to local authorities and asked them to urgently accommodate every homeless person with adequate facilities to enable social distancing and the hygiene requirements to reduce uh, and manage infection control. All of this was directly in response to the pandemic. So we, thought, we saw more than 5,000 rough sleepers accommodated in hotels and other short-term accommodation uh, services that were, that were mobilised. But there was a further 10,000 people back in that period of time, end of March, beginning of April, who were also accessing these services. So who were they? Where did they all come from? So um, we were involved in working in hotels in London, Manchester and Liverpool. And, and from our experience, we thought there was three key groups so there was the long term rough sleepers, people who had been uh, using services for some time on, and, and, and slept on the streets for some time. But then there was new people, new people who were accessing this service, people who had been perhaps sofa surfing or staying with family. And due to the pressures of the pandemic, their place had broken down, the place where they lived, or people who would had accommodation tied to where they worked. So there was a whole host of new people. And then the third key group was people with no recourse to public funds. So, so what did we do? Well, well, um, we worked with local authorities and we worked in a, in a, with our outreach workers, contacting people on the street, making access to them, also accepting referrals. What was so different was, uh, and, and Alex referred to this, barriers were removed completely. It was about access to accommodation. So transport was arranged. There was no need for lengthy assessments or waiting lists. Everything was uh, put together in a very rapid way. Uh, so um, when people arrived at the hotels, they found a room waiting for them, they found meals provided, uh, they found co cooperation between agencies like we'd never seen before. So healthcare professionals would be also on site, prescriptions were arranged, treatment services were on site for drugs and alcohol and, and mental health services. So all the immediate needs were, were put together. The way the hotels operated had hotel staff managing the housing side. There was security staff on site maintaining a safe and secure environment. That meant that our support staff were free to actually support people, to start having conversations about where they wanted to be, where they wanted to move to, what they wanted out of their life uh, in the future. I think what, what really strikes me was the cooperation, you know, GPs attending hotels uh, and all services just working together with a common goal 
uh, and that was to support people and to help manage uh, the risks uh, affected all of us through the pandemic. And it was a rapid response. So what were some of the key findings? What were some of the key things that we, 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 we saw? Uh, well, I think that we, um, we, we saw some uh, great uh, working together. So we just need to go back one. I've just skipped a slide. So what we thought was, after the initial fantastic response, it was amazing, but it was incredibly fragile because many of the contracts for these services were very short term. Most of them were due to come to, the end, to, come to an end in, at the end of June. So we got together as a group of providers through the NAPFED, you know, through the, the group I chair, but also working with other sector providers, as you can see many of them named there. And we got together and we said, we need to lobby the government. We need to lobby the government together. We'll be stronger with one voice. If we're all saying the government needs to do some of the same things, then that's got to be stronger than us all chipping away differently. So we said to the government and we wrote to Dame Louise Casey and we spoke to housing ministers and, and collectively as a group, saying that this is a real opportunity and the government needs to seize this opportunity and make sure that no one is given no option other than to return to the streets. So we need more housing, we need more support, and we need a, a, a plan for each of those individuals who are staying in those hotels to be resettled into long-term, permanent and appropriate accommodation. We got a good response, so the government did extend uh, many of the contracts in, in the hotels. The government did then announce the Next Steps accommodation programme where there was additional funding at the further £433 million allocated over four years to provide more accommodation and more support. Um, so then what we found was um, we had, some, we had some sense of security. We knew we was going to be working in the hotels longer. So then we conducted a short piece of research. And that's where we come on to the, some of the findings that we, uh, that we were able to uh, establish through this research. Now, we talked to the hotel staff. Uh, the researchers talked to the hotel staff. They talked to the security staff. They talked to our staff. Uh, but very importantly, they talked to the customers. Now, uh, we in the Manchester Hotel that we worked in, uh, we've today housed over 600 people in that hotel and over 75%, around 75% have been successfully moved on into uh, long-term suitable housing. So what was the key, you know, what, what really worked? Well, some of these things are on the screen now. So access to medication, access to support to manage uh, addictions enabled people to make the most of the environment. Now, some previous um, research and some previous discussions had said that housing a group of people in one site was going to be, you know, fraught with problems. And um, we didn't see that as a challenge. It didn't, it didn't present in the same way as perhaps you'd expect with 45 homeless people staying in one location. We found that, the research found that um, limiting the time people spent outside, which of course was part of the government's plan to manage the pandemic, reduced opportunities for negative or damaging uh, interactions and behaviours around the, around the vicinity of, of where the hotel was. Residents told us that they really um, embraced the daily routine of living in a hotel, feeling safe, were able to enjoy a sense of community, we felt that bringing together partners really galvanised efforts and, and everyone really worked together with cooperation. And there wasn't the usual uh, sometimes interagency conflict. Uh, and also the fact that there was there was a removal of any commissioning. Uh, so you weren't seen as competition anymore. That also made a, a significant uh, difference. The rapid access. I think that's one of the key things that customers told us that, you know, there wasn't a need for a lengthy assessment. Or there was no red tape. It was quick. Access was arranged. A, a transport was arranged, and it, a, a, a needs were addressed almost immediately. And then high quality uh, accommodation. In having your own shower, one of our customers told us that she had ten showers in the first twenty four hours of staying in the hotel. Mm -hmm. So you know, made a real uh, a real difference. But having that uh, quality environment. Uh, was a key, a key part of, 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 of the success of, of this service. So then um, moving on to um, how might this help us in the future? How might this make a difference to, to, the, to, the, way we, uh, to the way we deliver homeless services in the future? Well, I think there's some obvious ones. I think um, good quality accommodation, 
with the facilities that I've described the hotels uh, have provided, removing barriers, removing the, you know, the need for lengthy assessments for waiting lists, for referral panels, all of these things that uh, make a big difference to being able to strike and engage with a person when they're ready to engage. Uh, uh, so we thought that, that we, that's absolutely something that we need to continue. The rapid response, the interagency working, the healthcare, the advice, the support, the access to meals, all kind of basic needs really made a big difference. Uh, and, and the fact that um, there was a real sense of safety and security within the environment that was maintained. It, the, the service was well staffed, it was well resourced. And it created a real sense of community among partners, the, our staff and other, other professionals, but very much amongst the customers. So, so what did the customers tell us? So in the interviews we conducted, the customers told us that they felt that their health had improved, their mental health was better, their overall feeling of well-being had increased, the nutrition had improved, they felt safe, secure and protected. Now, for someone who's lived on, on the streets, that's a massive, massive difference. And they felt more positive about the future. So we welcome uh, the focus and the action from government during the pandemic. We are concerned that the response in the, in the second wave has not been as strong as, as the initial wave. And we are seeing further increases right now in, in people roof sleeping. But moving forward, we need a clear strategy and a strong, stable uh, funding regime to, su to support homeless services. And today, many of you have seen that there's been an announcement around the rough sleep account for 2020. There's been a 37% drop, which is, which is really good progress. However, I do feel if the count had been conducted back in April or May, it would have been significant, the improvement would have been significantly more than it was because we are seeing more people uh, back on the street uh, uh, right now. So, so uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to come back to Neil uh, and then take questions later. Thanks. Okay, John, uh, thanks very much.